love. It's one of the most confusing, one of the most difficult topics that we tend to think we understand, uh, and yet the fact of the matter is we really don't understand it the way that we think we do. Uh, now, one reason for all the confusion, it's based on the fact that we use the word love in reference to so many different things. For example, uh, I personally love hamburgers, and I love my wife, Brenda. I love puppies, and I love the Lord Jesus Christ. And while it's true that I can honestly apply the word love to hamburgers and Brenda and puppies and Jesus, it's also true that, listen, my love for hamburgers is a different sort of love than my love for my wife, Brenda. And my love for puppies is different from my love for our Savior, Jesus Christ. And with that being the case, uh, the topic of love can be extremely confusing. I can truly say I love hamburgers, Brenda, puppies, and Jesus, and yet I'm referring to different kinds of love. With that being the case, it's no wonder why the very precise ancient Greeks used four different words uh, uh, so that they could properly draw a distinction between the different types of love that we express and experience. As a matter of fact, the Greeks used one word, phylos, when they spoke about the affection that's found in friendship. And so phylos is a friendly kind of love. And, and then the Greeks also used the word storge in reference to the bond of love that occurs between a parent and and their children. The Greeks use the word eros when they refer to the physical attraction of intimate love. And then the Greeks use the word agape when they refer to the charitable love that results in self-sacrifice. Now, with all this in mind, we should take a moment to ask, you know, when it, when it comes to loving the Lord, what does it mean? How, how should we go about loving the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, in order to answer this question, we're going to consider a conversation that took place between the Lord Jesus and an unnamed lawyer. And as we begin to drill down into the content of this conversation, we're going to begin to see what it means to truly love the Lord in the way that we should. With this as the goal, if you would, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Here we find this conversation uh, occurring between uh, the Lord and this lawyer. And as you make your way to the 10th chapter of Luke's gospel account, I just want to take a moment to put our text back into its context. It'll first help us to remember that the time had come for the Messiah to make his way to Jerusalem. And in, pre in preparation for uh, this journey to Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus sent ahead of him 70 of his disciples to go and preach the gospel so that the people in those places might be prepared for his arrival. And as he, as he made his way from Galilee to Jerusalem, the Lord Jesus found himself face to face with a skeptical lawyer. With this context in mind, if you would, let's pick up our study of Luke chapter 10. I want to begin reading there at verse 25. Here Luke declares, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. Now here in these verses, we find the Lord face to face with a Jewish lawyer who was trying to trap Jesus with a loaded question. The reason I say this is based on that word tested, which is found there in the middle of verse 25. The original Greek word, well, it stems from a root, which was used of those who would skeptically scrutinize others with malicious intent. The original Greek word was also used of those who engage in irreligious or immoral actions in order to test the patience or the avenging power of Christ Jesus. And therefore, you know, when the lawyer approached the Lord Jesus, he was actually attempting to trap the Lord with, with this loaded question. I like the way that the scholars who created the American Standard Version of the Bible rendered the beginning of verse 25. Here's how they put it. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and made trial of him. This lawyer made trial of him, or in other words, this legal expert was, was actually attempting to place the Lord Jesus on trial. 
And what this means is that this unnamed lawyer wasn't hoping to learn anything from the Lord. It's not like this lawyer came along and said, maybe Jesus can teach me something about salvation. No, instead, he was trying to expose our Savior as being a false teacher who would then break down under the scrutiny of legal examination. It's as if this lawyer came along and said, I've got the trap question, and it's going to show everybody that this guy's a false teacher, and so what must I do to obtain eternal life is what he asks. But that being the case, I want to continue to consider his loaded question. And so if you would look with me again there at verse 25 here, Luke writes, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, as we take a closer look at this question, it's important for us to understand that this lawyer wasn't asking how he could be saved. You know, he, he, didn't, he wasn't coming along and saying, hey, what, uh, you know, how can I be saved? How can, I, I'm a sinner, and, and, and so how can I be forgiven for all of my sins? Can, can I trust in you, Jesus, to save me? That's not his question. No, instead he's asking, what works must I perform in order to earn or obtain eternal life? That's his question. He wanted to know which works were required for those who wanted to work their way to heaven. And with this question in mind, let's consider the, the, way, uh, the way that Jesus here responds to his question with another question. Look with me there at verse 26. Here we learn that Jesus says to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? Jesus was, of course, referring to the Mosaic law here, and, and which includes the Ten Commandments. And as we consider the way that the Lord Jesus is pointing this lawyer to the Mosaic law, I, I should take a moment to point out that Jesus was not presenting a plan of salvation. Please grasp that for a moment here. He wasn't presenting this man with a plan of salvation. No, instead, he's answering the loaded question that the lawyer you know, uh, had asked. The, the lawyer wanted to know what he needed to do to be saved. He wanted to know what he needed to perform in order to work his way to heaven. And in response, Jesus answers the question with another question by pointing him back to the Mosaic law. What does the law say? You want to work your way to heaven? Then check out the law. See what the law says. As a matter of fact, look with me again there at verse 26. Here Jesus says to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he, that is the lawyer, answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, as we consider the response of this lawyer, you might be interested to know that he was actually quoting a passage that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's where Moses actually declares, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. It's also interesting to note that uh, this is actually a summary of the, the first section of the Ten Commandments, which the Ten Commandments, we call this the Decalogue, uh, you know, because there's, there's Ten Commandments. And in the first section of the Ten Commandments, it's all about our relationship with God. And it, it can all be summed up with, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind. We should also notice that the unnamed lawyer also included a, a simple statement which summarized the second section of the Ten Commandments. It's found there at the end of verse 27 where we find him confessing that the Lord commanded the children of Israel to love their neighbor as much as they love themselves. And this summary of the second section of the Decalogue is something that we're going to consider in our study next week as we consider how we, you know, how we ought to love one another. But as we consider the way that this lawyer summed up the Decalogue with, with these statements, we must not fail to notice that the Lord Jesus agreed that this was the right summation of what the law requires. As a matter of fact, uh, look with me again there at verse 28. Here the Lord Jesus declares, you have answered rightly. He's saying you're right. Your summation of the law and what's required of those who want to work their way to heaven is correct. The lawyer had proper understanding of the law. He was a, a good lawyer, so to speak. This was actually the same summation that the Lord Jesus even presented to a scribe who came and asked him about the law of Moses. And with this as the focus, hold your place here in the Gospel of Luke, and let's turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 12. 
See, so it's here in the 12th chapter of Mark's gospel account where we find a certain scribe. He's asking the Lord, uh, Lord Jesus here to identify the first and the greatest of all the commandments that God gave to Moses. You know, there, there's 10 commandments and, and there's more than 600 uh, rules and regulations. And, and so the scribe wants to know, what, what's, what's the best? What's the greatest? What's the most important of all of them? And with this question in mind, let's consider the answer that Jesus presented here in Mark chapter 12. Look with me there beginning at verse 29. Here Jesus answers, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. In these verses, we find the Lord Jesus, he, he sums up the Mosaic law in the same way that the lawyer had back in Luke chapter 10. And not only that, but then here in Mark 12, we find this certain scribe, he's signing off in, on this summation. And so this legal scribe comes along and says, this is correct. He agrees with Jesus. He says that Jesus was speaking the truth about the law of the Lord. With all this in mind, we ought to make our way back to Luke chapter 10 where we find the Lord Jesus challenging that lawyer then to keep all of this law. Let's take a closer look at the Lord's, the Lord's response here, which is found here in Luke chapter 10, verse 28. Here Jesus declares, you have answered rightly, do this and you will live. Now, as we consider this answer, it's important to remember that the lawyer wanted to know what he must do in order to obtain eternal life. He came along and said, hey, what are the works that I need to do in order to obtain everlasting life? And Jesus here helps him to understand that those who want to work their way to heaven must do the law. Jesus was helping him to understand that those who want to work their way to heaven are required by law to keep the entirety of the law and without fail if they want to earn or obtain everlasting life. And it's for this reason that Jesus says, do this and you will live. The law that you just summed up, do it. And you'll obtain eternal life. In order to further grasp the point that Jesus was making, we should consider something that James wrote in his epistle. And so if you would hold your place here in the gospel of Luke, let's turn our Bibles to James chapter 2. And as you make your way to the second chapter of James, I just want to take a moment to point out that those who attempt to work their way to heaven according to the works of the law, well, they're eventually going to discover we've all sinned. They're only going to find out that we've all fallen short of God's perfect standard. Therefore, those who attempt to earn the favor of God through their good works, those who attempt to work their way into heaven by keeping the law, they will ultimately fail. In order to understand why, if you would look with me here at James chapter 2, I want to draw your attention beginning there at verse 8. Here James declares, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin, and are convicted by the law as transgressors, for whoever shall keep the whole law, and yet stumble in one point... He is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Now, to sum all of this up with simplicity, listen, those who try to work their way to heaven will ultimately fail. And the reason why is because we've all broken at least one of the commandments. You know, when, when, when we're told to not lie because lying is a sin, I'm going to guess that we've all told at least one lie in our life. And if we have broken one law, then we're guilty of all. Not only that, but remember, we're all born under the curse of original sin. 
And, and how is it that we're born under the curse of original sin? Well, Adam and Eve also stumbled in one point. God told them to not eat the forbidden fruit. And what did they do? They ate the forbidden fruit. And as a result, you know, they fell into sin and, and they became guilty. And, and as they began to reproduce, you know, they passed the curse along to all of their, their children all the way down to us. And so we were born in need of salvation, Therefore, even if you start today to try to work your way to heaven by keeping the law, you will ultimately fail because we were born with a sin nature. And therefore, you better believe that our works are completely insufficient. Therefore, the lawyer's question was a loaded question. When he asked, what shall I do to obtain eternal life? It's it's based on this idea that he has a chance that he possibly could. And yet I can assure you that no one will be saved by the works of the law. I like the way that Paul put it in Galatians chapter two. There he declares, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Grasp that for a second. By the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. No one is going to be saved by keeping the law. And the reason why is because we've all failed to keep the commandments of God. Thankfully for us, God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Rather than asking, what must I do to earn everlasting life. The question ought to to be this, who can I trust in to save me from the punishment that I deserve? And the answer is Jesus Christ. And knowing that God has extended his perfect love to us through the cross of Christ, well, then those who trust in Jesus ought to spend time learning how we can respond to that love by loving him back. We've got to spend time learning what it means to love the Lord. And with this as the goal, let's make our way back now to Luke chapter 10. I want to begin to answer this question by considering this summation of the entire law that we find here in Luke chapter 10. Look with me again at verse 27. Here the lawyer answers and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Now, as we consider this command, this summation of the Decalogue, as we consider what it means to love the Lord our God, it should be noted that this lawyer, uh, as he spoke about loving the Lord, uh, was using the Greek word agapeo. He wasn't using phylos, he wasn't using storge, he wasn't using eros, he was using that word agapeo or agape. And so he's saying here that you shall love agapeo the Lord. We are, we are to love the Lord uh, with this specific kind of love. And, and just to be clear about what kind of love we're talking about, this is the same Greek word that Jesus used in John chapter 3 where he assures us that God so loved, God so loved, God so uh, agapeo the world, that, that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so we see that agape love is the sort of love that led the Father to send his only begotten son to offer himself as a sacrifice for us so that sinners like us could be saved by faith in the cross of Christ. I should also point out that Jesus used that same Greek word in John chapter 14 where he declares, if you love me, keep my commandments. Same Greek word, if you love me, if you agape me. Keep my commandments. In other words, if you truly have agape love for the Lord, then you will want to keep his commandments. We don't want to keep his commandments to get saved, but if we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ, then we will have this new desire to keep the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what this means then is that those who love the Lord with agape love, we will learn to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, and with all of our mind. And with that being the case, we should take a moment to ask, do I really love the Lord in the way that I should? Do I really love the Lord in the way that I should? Or or, or more specifically, do I really love the Lord with all of my heart? 
This brings us to the first point of our study because listen, the, that word heart found there in verse 27 was translated from the Greek word cardia, which refers, of course, to the physical heart. And while it's true that this physical heart is this organ which is the center of, of our circulatory system, it's also true that the same Greek word, cardia, uh, it, it's used in reference to the innermost part of the person. When you talk about the heart of something, you know, you, you're sometimes referring to like the innermost part of whatever it is that you're talking about. Or in other words, when we refer to, you know, a person's immaterial heart, we're, we're talking about the innermost uh, part of that person. And, and not only that, but when we talk about the immaterial heart of a person, we're also, we're also talking about their passion. We're talking about their purpose in life. Sometimes we talk about, you know, people who are all heart. And, and, you know, it's not like in our minds we're thinking, oh, yeah, they're just like one big, you know, heart-looking muscle with veins and, you know. No, no. When we say that someone is all heart, we're actually using an idiom which is intended to applaud their positive attitude, like, like their, their love and their charity and their goodwill and their generosity. It's also important for us to remember that the lawyer uh, was actually quoting a, a command that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And, and so we can actually look to the Hebrew word that Moses used back in Deuteronomy to, to better understand this word heart. The Hebrew word rendered heart back in Deuteronomy 6, uh, it speaks of our immaterial heart, which produces our inclinations, our determinations, and our resolutions. Not only that, but the Hebrew word rendered heart also refers to the seat of our appetites and our endeavors, as well as our affections and our emotions. That's right, when we talk about someone's heart, we're talking about their emotions. And, and with that being the case, we should ask, you know, how do we love the Lord with agape love? Well, we love him with the passionate emotions that we find in our heart. Or in other words, we love the Lord emotionally. Now, in order to further grasp what this means to love the Lord with the passionate emotions of our heart, we should consider something that Paul wrote in his letter to the Christians in Galatia. So hold your place here in the Gospel of Luke. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. And as you make your way to the fifth chapter of Galatians, I just want to take a moment to point out that, you know, our heart is actually filled with many different emotions. And, and you might not know that. And like, if you're a man like myself, you know, I used to think, I'm not emotional, you know. Maybe I've got two emotions. You know, there was, there was anger and then there was hunger, you know. And sometimes those combine to, to make me hangry, you know. And, and, and that's, that's the extent of my emotions. And that's not the case. I'm actually a very emotional person. Emotions include happiness, sadness, disgust, fear, surprise, anxiety, anger, and the list could go on and on. The people who wear their hearts on their sleeves, you know what we mean by that, is that they have no problem expressing their emotions. They have no, no problem presenting their passions. Their, their heart is on their sleeve. But then there's others who like to keep a lid on their emotions and, and they keep their cards close to the chest, which doesn't mean that they're not emotional. It just means that they don't want you to know what their emotions are. And so they just kind of bury them down underneath their actions. Either way, whether you wear your heart on your sleeve or you keep your cards close to the chest, either way, we all experience a very wide range of emotions and it's important to understand that these emotions can actually become decision drivers regardless of whether people can see the emotion or not. And what's even worse about this is that there are many Christians in the church today who are completely controlled by the passionate emotions of their heart. And many times these passionate emotions can lead us to live a, a life of sin if, if we're not careful. If this sounds like your struggle, then I encourage you to consider something that Paul is writing here in Galatians chapter 5. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 24, here Paul declares, those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Christian, listen, those who want to learn how to love the Lord with all of their heart... We must make sure that we are actively crucifying every carnal emotion, uh, which is encapsulated here with the words passions and desires. We have passions and we have desires, and, 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 and with this comes all these emotions, which would lead us to live for the lust of the flesh. And, and those who act upon these passions and desires, they are not loving the Lord. 
We can't pursue sinful passions and desires. We can't live for the lust of the flesh and simultaneously love the Lord with agape love. Therefore, rather than allowing our emotions to control us, we've been called to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can receive the spiritual power that we need to live for the Lord by loving the Lord with even the passionate emotions of our heart. And, and we should passionately love the Lord, but we should also grab a hold of those passions and bring them into subjection so that we can uh, put our love for the Lord above our love for our, for our own sinful lusts. We must learn how to love the Lord with agape love by loving him emotionally. Secondly, we should also learn to love the Lord with agape love by loving him personally. And in order to explain what I mean by this, let's make our way back to Luke chapter 10. And let's take another look at, at the law of love, which we find here in our text today. If you would, uh, let's take another look at verse 27, where this lawyer answers and says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, uh, that word soul was translated from the Greek word suke, which literally means to breathe or to blow. And while it's difficult for us to draw a distinction between the immaterial heart and the immaterial soul, and I believe that there are some connecting points here, but listen, it'll help us to realize that the heart, this is the seat of our passionate emotions, while the soul is used in reference to the very life force which animates our physical bodies. In other words, the, the word soul refers to the very inner being of man, which is animated by the breath of life that the Lord has given us. And so think about it like this. The, the life of the physical body is the blood, but the life of our immaterial man is the breath of the soul. The proof of my point can be found in Genesis chapter 2. It's verse 7 where Moses informs us that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's talking about the physical body of Adam. But then Moses tells us that God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now, when Moses tells us that the Lord breathed the breath of life, the, the words breathe and breath, the, the, those are uh, words that derive from uh, the, the, the same word for soul. But, but there at the end of the verse, we actually see the word soul that's translated from the same Hebrew word that Moses used in Deuteronomy chapter 6 when he commanded the children of Israel to love the Lord with all of their soul. And so we see the, the word soul here uh, in the Hebrew is connected to breath and breathing. And so when God breathed the breath of life into the, the physical body of Adam, that's when Adam became a living soul. And so we see that the soul is synonymous with the breath of life that has come from the Lord, which is why we ought to use every breath that we have to, to sing the praises of our Savior. We have to see every breath as a reason to, to love the Lord. We should love the Lord with every breath we breathe. It's also important to understand that the, the life force of the soul, well, this is also the immaterial basis for our personhood. You know, if we're all just material beings, then there's really not much beyond appearance uh, between you and me. But the soul comes along and, and helps, uh, helps you to recognize that I'm a very different person than you. You know, uh, the soul or the personhood or the individual personality makes us very distinctly different. And the evidence of this can be found in the fact that the Greek word suke, uh, which is rendered soul, it's also the basis for our English word psyche uh, as well as psycho. Just interesting. This word suke it refers to the soul, but it also it has to do with our psyche, which for, refers to the personification of the soul. Therefore, when the Lord Jesus commanded us to love the Lord with all of our soul, he was actually challenging us to love the Lord with the soulish life force that animates our personality or, or helps us to identify who we are as a person. In order to further grasp the point that I'm seeking to make here, let's consider something that Peter wrote in his first epistle. If you would hold your place here in the Gospel of Luke, and let's turn in our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. 
And as you make your way to the second chapter of 1 Peter, I just want to take a moment to point out that our personality, you know, it has to do with our character, and, and it also has to do with our temperament. Our personality is demonstrated by our disposition, which is then revealed in the way that we react and respond to the situations and circumstances that we experience. And, and with all of that in mind, I just want to consider an encouragement that Peter presents here in 1 Peter chapter 2. If you would look with me there, beginning at verse 11. Here Peter declares, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against what? The soul. We are to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the very breath of our life, the very uh, you know, personhood of our being. And he tells us in, in verse 12 to have our conduct honorable among the Gentiles that when they speak against us, as evildoers that we may, uh, by our good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Now, uh, Peter here is referring to the fleshly lusts which war against our psyche or our suke or, or our soul. And knowing that these fleshly lusts will have a negative impact on our soul, Peter's saying, hey, abstain from those carnal cravings. Protect your soul, protect your personality, protect your personhood from the fleshly lusts which will only lead us back into sin and damage our psyche. We are to abstain from these things by learning how to love the Lord with the soulish life force that animates our personality. Therefore, those who want to learn how to love the Lord with the agape love we have to abstain from fleshly lusts, which would only damage our soul. Now, this leads us to the third category, which we find back in Luke chapter 10. You see, uh, those who want to learn how to love the Lord with agape love, we should love him emotionally, and we should also love him personally. Uh, not only that, but we should also love the Lord actively and in order to explain what I mean by this, let's make our way now back to Luke chapter 10. I want to take another look at the law of love that we find here in our text today. If you would look with me once again at verse 27. Here the lawyer answers and says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now here in this verse, we're reminded of the fact that those who truly love the Lord with agape love will love the Lord with our strength. That word strength? Well, it's translated from a Greek word which speaks of our physical capabilities. Not only that, but the same Greek word was also used in reference to the force of, of our muscular might. And, and some of us have more muscular might than others, but, but regardless of how much you know, strength we actually have, we are to take the strength that we actually have and use it to love the Lord. That being the case, those who set out to love the Lord with all of their strength, well, we ought to use our force, the, the force of our physicality, uh, and, and we ought to use this force or use this strength so that we can serve our Savior in active ways. We've been called to love the Lord with agape love by loving him with an active love. Christian, listen. When Moses commanded the children of Israel to love the Lord with all of their strength, he was actually calling them to actively love the Lord by serving God according to the sacrificial system. They were to physically take sacrificial animals and they were to physically take those animals to the, to the temple and they were to physically offer those, those sacrificial animals up. They were, they were called to physically put their hand on the head of the sacrifice and they were physically you know, doing all of these things. It was very physical. Well, thankfully, the Lord Jesus Christ has fulfilled the sacrificial system for us. And so we no longer take animals to the temple and, and offer them up as, as sacrifices. But still here in the church age, we've also been called to actively love the Lord by using our strength to serve our Savior according to the physical capabilities that we are able to perform. With that being the case, we should take a moment to examine our own lives by asking do I actually love the Lord? Am I actively loving the Lord by using my strength to serve my Savior? Do I actually serve him by actively engaging in ministry with my physicality? 
And listen, not only should we become believers who are actively serving our Savior by using our physical strength, but we should also learn to love the Lord by actively abstaining from the temptations that would lead us back into a life of sin. And in order to, uh, to further explain the point that I'm seeking to make here, I just want to consider something that, that Paul wrote to the Christians in Corinth. And so hold your place here in the Gospel of Luke, and let's turn in our Bibles now to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And as you make your way to 1 Corinthians 9, I just want to take a moment to point out that there are many ways that we can actively love the Lord by physically removing ourselves from specific situations that would result in sinful temptations. For example, personally, I don't walk down the liquor aisle at the grocery store. Now, don't misunderstand my point. Because I'm not saying it's a sin to walk down the liquor aisle, aisle at the grocery store. And yet I know for me, looking back at my past before coming to Christ, you know, I was an alcoholic, I was a drug addict, and I know that one beer for me is going to lead to another, and then that's going to lead to another, and next thing you know, I'm smoking pot and then snorting cocaine, and I'm going down to Sixth Street and getting into a fight with anybody that looks at me wrong. I know that's me because that's the way I was before I came to Christ. And with that being the case, I don't put myself in a situation where, I'd be str that, that, where I would struggle with the temptation to drink. And so I just physically avoid the liquor aisle at the gro grocery store. I won't even walk down the aisle. Why? Well, because I don't want to look at those beers, and I don't want to look at that alcohol. I don't even want to have those images in my mind. I'm just going to go to another aisle and, and, and just bypass it, you know, entirely. At the same time, I won't sit at the bar at a restaurant. You know, if I go to a restaurant and I'm hungry, and they're like, yeah, well, it's going to be 30 minutes for a table, but the bar is open if you want to go sit over there, and, and, and you can be eating in 10 minutes. Oh, 10 minutes versus 30 minutes. All i got to do is sit at a bar and have some bartender saying, what can I get you? No, thank you. I'll wait the time. You know, clearly I'm not going to starve to death waiting 30 minutes. Yeah, I'm not going to sit at the bar. Why? Because I don't want to, I'm not going to physically place myself in a place of temptation. In this way, I actively love the Lord by physically avoiding this temptation to sin. With all this in mind, I'm going to consider how Paul addresses this here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you would look with me there at verse 24, here Paul declares, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Here in these verses, we find Paul describing the way that he was disciplining his body. He, he was disciplining his body so that he could you know, actively live in subjection to the law of the Lord. He physically removed himself from tempting situations so that he could walk in the obedience of faith. And in light of his example, we can see that those who want to love the Lord with all of their strength, we should not only serve our Savior by you know, physically showing up to church and serving in the ministry that the Lord has given to us. You know, this is not only you know, this, this positive approach, but we should also actively remove ourselves from temptation. We should learn to love the Lord by actively abstaining from any sinful activity that would lead us back into the bondage of sin. And this brings us to our fourth and final category because, listen, those who want to learn how to love the Lord with agape love, we should not only love him emotionally, we should not only love him personally with our soul, and we should not only love him actively with the strength of our body, but those who want to learn how to love the Lord should also love him mentally. With this as the focus, if you would, let's make our way back to Luke chapter 10. Let's take another look at the law of love that's found here in our text today. And if you would look with me again at verse 27, here this lawyer answers and says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. Now, that word mind 
It's translated from a Greek word which speaks of the mental ability to, be, to, to think and to feel. And, and just to be clear, the word mind here refers to the intellectual capabilities as well as the mental capacity that each person has. It not only includes our thoughts and our insights, but it also refers to our perceptions as well as our imaginations. And as we consider all of these various categories for the mind, it's crucial for every Christian to realize that loving the Lord with all of our mind, it means that we've been called to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Now, in order to prove my point, let's consider the encouragement that Paul presents to the Christians in Corinth. If you would, let's turn in our Bibles now to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. As you make your way to the 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians, I just want to take a moment to point out that the mind, uh, it tends to be the place where most temptations begin. You know, active sin typically begins with, with mental uh, imaginations. And, and it's sad to say that, uh, you know, many Christians uh, feel a freedom to entertain sinful thoughts. And one reason why is because, well, the people around us can't see what we were thinking. You know, if I had an app on my phone that just kind of showed me exactly what was going on in your mind, uh, chances are we'd be a little bit more careful about what we were thinking. But there isn't such an app. And, and, and I don't know what's going on in your mind, and you don't know what's going on in, 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 my, in my mind. And, and, and it's sad that many Christians take advantage of this uh, and, and just allow their mind to wander and think about all sorts of sinful things. And if this sounds like something that you struggle with, I would remind you that there is one person who knows what's going on in your mind. And it's the one who truly matters. The Lord knows exactly what's happening in our minds. As a matter of fact, there are several scriptures that clue us into the fact that the Lord knows all of our thoughts. Matthew tells us that Jesus knew the thoughts of the scribes who were thinking evil thoughts about him. And Mark tells us in his gospel that Jesus perceived in his spirit the reasonings of those who were rejecting him within themselves. Luke tells us that Jesus knew the thoughts of the scribes and the Pharisees who, who were setting out to trap him. And, and John tells us that Jesus knew which of those who were following him didn't really believe in him. Jesus knew all of these things. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus knows every thought that we entertain within those dark recesses of our mind. That being the case, uh, we should consider Paul's point, which is found here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Look with me there, beginning at verse 3. Here Paul declares, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Here in these verses, we find Paul encouraging every Christian to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. In other words, uh, whatever is happening in our minds, you know, whatever uh, strongholds are there, whatever arguments we have, uh, what, whatever thoughts are, are, are taking place, we are to take hold of those thoughts before we begin to act upon them. And if we have sinful thoughts and tempting thoughts, uh, uh, we shouldn't spend any time, you know, entertaining these ideas. But rather, we are to take a hold of them. We are to make sure that all of our thoughts actually line up with the truth of God's word so that we can make sure that we are uh, obeying the Lord even in our thought life. We, we would do well then to capture and constrain those thoughts before they become actions. In this way, we will begin to love the Lord with agape love as we love him with all of our mind. Now, to sum all of this up, listen, those who have been saved by faith in Jesus Christ have then been called to learn how to love the Lord with every aspect of our being. So learning how to love the Lord has nothing to do with earning salvation. No, instead, because we've received the salvation of, of the Lord by faith in Jesus Christ, we now ought to learn how to love him with agape love. We should learn how to love the Lord emotionally. 
We do this by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can crucify the flesh with its passions and its desires. And in this way, we're able to bring the passionate emotions that we all experience within our heart. We're able to bring all of this in line uh, to, to the obedience of faith uh, so that we can truly love the Lord. And not only should we learn how to love the Lord emotionally, but we should learn how to love the Lord personally. And this includes the decision to abstain from those fleshly lusts which are warring against our soul. At the same time, we learn to love the Lord as as we use every breath of our life to proclaim the praises of the one uh, who loves us with perfect love. We should learn how to love the Lord actively as well, which, which not only includes the physical actions by which we accomplish the ministry that the Lord has given to us, but we should also learn to love the Lord by, by actively abstaining from every sinful activity, even physically removing ourselves from temptation so that we're not led back into the bondage of our fallen flesh. And finally, we should learn how to love the Lord mentally by focusing our thoughts on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we start entertaining sinful thoughts, we are to take those thoughts captive and bring our mind back to the truth of God's word. We are are to allow the, the truth of God's word to renew our minds and help us to think the right thoughts for the glory of God. As we consider this, we can see here that there's no, you know, category left out. And, and, and while there are Christians who love to compartmentalize their lives and, you know, this, this part is for the Lord and this part is for me and, you know, I'll give, I'll, I'll, I'll give Jesus Sunday, you know, but Monday, Thursday, Thursday you know, Saturday, uh, these are my days and, and maybe I'll show up on Wednesday, but, you know, I'm going to compartmentalize, compartmentalize my life in such a way that some of it's for God and some of it's for his glory, but, but some of it's for me too. And, and I'll have one portion of, of my mind for the glory of God, but then this, there's this other portion of my mind that's for, there's one part of my life that is physically for God, and then there's that, this other part that's physically for me. And No, we, we have to stop compartmentalizing our life in this sort of way. Our entire life should be lived for the glory of God. And every aspect of our being, whether we're talking, you know, about our, our heart or our soul or our body or our mind, everything should be for the glory of God. And therefore, we must learn how to love the Lord with agape love, by loving him with every aspect of our being. And it's important for us to remember that the only reason that we can even begin to love him is because he first loved us. He first loved us. He made the first move. He sent his only begotten son to come and die for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that we could believe in him and so that we could receive his perfect love. And as we receive his perfect perfect love, then we ought to turn around and love him back in the same way. And if you want a perfect example of what agape love actually looks like, study the life of Jesus Christ. Because if, if anybody presents us with a perfect picture of true agape love. It's the Lord. And as Christians, we've been called to follow in his footsteps. Therefore, if you want to learn how to love the Lord, then study how the Lord loves us. He is love incarnate. And therefore, he is a perfect picture of what love should look like. And as we consider the agape love that the Lord has extended to us, let's remember that you know, we're only able to love him because he first loved us. And with that being the case, let's become those believers who see the privilege of spending the rest of eternity loving the Lord. That's how we get to spend the rest of eternity, Christian. Loving the Lord with agape love. And so today, let's learn how to love him with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, and with all of our mind, and all for the glory of God. Thank <laughs> you.